with several publications in refereed international conferences and journals on complex systems, architecture, design, AI, and ML. He is active in professional societies, including IEEE, INCOSE, and SAE. And he has received several awards, including the 2010 Honeywell Technology Solutions Annual Leadership Excellence Award and the 2016 Outstanding Service Award from the International Council on Systems Engineering. And he has been the te technical program chair for several international conferences. And he actively interacts with various academic institutions and has been guest faculty at IIT Bombay Aerospace Department and also adjunct faculty at Manipal Institute of Technology. Right. And thank you, Dr. Ramon, for being here today. And look forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks uh, once again for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, this talk is on uh, machine learning models for performance in data predictions. Uh, so we get on to this is a broad outline of my talk. So first we'll talk about uh, even introduction to complex systems and machine learning. Right. So we'll start looking at what are complex systems and then uh, what are some of the characteristics of complex systems. And then we'll have a brief introduction to machine learning. Then we look at how some of these models can be used for predicting the performance of complex system. Right? Then we'll start looking at how we also know, use these models for predicting the behavior of complex systems. Okay? So that's a broad outline of the talk. Um, so to begin with, uh, for a brief introduction to complex systems, we'll first look at some of the systems concepts. Okay? So I'm from the systems concepts, so systems thinking and system concepts matter a lot when you start dealing with complexity. So we start looking at that. So one key concept I'd like to introduce is what is called MOEs, okay, the measures of effectiveness. So at the, in system thinking, we look at uh, what is the system, right? What are the system, what are the subsystems? Uh, and when we start go going and trying to handle that kind of complexity, the MOEs play a crucial part. So what are MOEs? Okay, so MOEs are nothing but the measures of success that are related to the objective of the system. So what, what is our system? Let's say our system is an aircraft. Right? So what are the MOEs of an aircraft is what we start looking at. at the, we look at from the system perspective. Right? So for instance, let's take a moment. One MOE would be, uh, say, the time it takes for you for it to respond to your interaction. So I let you say, we press some of the key band, right? And then if it takes one minute for each of it to respond, then obviously you will not be uh, happy, right? So as a customer or as a user of the system, you would be interested in the response time to a user action. Or, uh, so that will become like an MOE, right? So we start looking at from a system perspective, we start looking at, hey, this is a system and what are the MOEs? So that is very crucial. Only, only when we have a understanding of what the MOEs are, uh, which means it will require you to prioritize and say, these are the most important MOEs. The subsequent decisions and trade-offs all will be based on how good or how optimally you are able to make the MOEs. So we we'll start looking at what is complex system. So typically, when we look at, when we look, use the term adjective complex, uh, we associate it with something like we are not able to understand that. So that is something what we say is complex. Right? So complexity from a system perspective is trying to uh, gauge how difficult it is for me to predict what the system is going to do, right? so which is essentially the uh, how accurately the future behavior of the system is going to exist. Right? So we start looking at this look at this figure. So when you look at complexity, there are three parts, right? So one is the system that's being observed, right? And then there's a capability of the observer. And then what is it that the observer is trying to understand or predict to the system? So, so for me, something may be very complex, but for it may be easy. You know, the capability of the observer comes into play. So we have a complex, complex system. And then the behavior I'm trying to predict, right? So we are trying to look at any system is going to exhibit multiple behaviors. Some behaviors I have a better understanding than I said this is what is going to happen. Some behaviors it may not be very difficult. For example, human behavior. It's talked about saying, yeah, at some point in time it is kind of predictable, but then at some point in time it is not easy to predict what is human behavior. Uh, so when you start looking at complex systems, typically we'll say that hey, there is a lot of interaction that are happening in the system. We're starting to look at cause and effect. It's very difficult to say that. This effect is because of these causes. So you're going to have a lot of uh, uh, system, subsystems interacting with each other, uh, difficult to, uh, in establishing cause and effect chain. We say, yeah, it's pretty complex, trying to understand what that is. 
One more property that is talked about in complex system is what is called emergence. Emergence or emergent behavior. You start looking at what that is there. So this, I think many of you may be familiar with. Plot of verbs. So what's special about that? Complex shapes. Yeah. So why do they take those kind of specific shapes? Easy for them to fly. So, which means like essentially when they are, there is some uh, aerodynamic property that comes in which reduces the drag that they experience when flying. Basically, these migratory birds they fly over you know, thousands of miles. Right? So they fly in a specific formation. Now, if you look at that end system, a property that emerges is your, let's say, your aerodynamic drag is less. Now, that property cannot be attributed to any one bird that is here or one set of interaction because happens it emerges outside all of these interactions of these birds flying together in that formation. Right? That is the question. The behavior emerges out of the various interactions between the birds. You can't pinpoint one bird and say this bird is causing the uh, emergent behavior. Right? So, so other examples you'll find typically in natural world like uh, for example uh, the colonies of ants. Similarly the form of bees that are flying and not in So a lot of uh, if uh, this property was most influenced in natural systems, then trying to understand how they apply to engineer systems. And so that's an emergent we can really talk about here. So, so when you start looking at complex systems, right? So what do you mean by complex system? And so if you're taking an aircraft or a space transport with, with spacecraft or something, it has tens of thousands of components of systems, right? Very difficult for a single person or a small set of people to even envision what is going to happen. Right? So how they are handling complexity? So one uh, thing they do is they start breaking down the system into various subsystems on a hierarchy, like a tree hierarchy. Right? So for example, they first talk about saying that, hey, that's a space transportation. So what are the main subsystems? Maybe that's an external tank, that is an orbiter, that is an orbital system. That one level. And then they start looking at, okay, if you take orbiter as a system, what are the subsystems? Right? You can take, uh, like, for example, avionics, environment control, level. And again, they say, right? Can you take avionics as a system? What are the subsystems? Right? So at each level, you can view that as a system and then look at what are the subsystems and what are the uh, higher level systems, right? So, for example, to meet the functionality of an orbiter, we are, we are having, say, three or four or five subsystems, external and avionics, all of that. All of these subsystems have to talk to each other. They interact with each other to get the functionality of the higher level system. That's a key concept in system hierarchy, especially when you start dealing with complex systems. Many systems broken down into multiple subsystems, and each of those you can again apply the system concept. So then, so what is the functionality of orbiter system? It will have a set of functions. How are those functions realized? Those functions are realized by those subsystems meeting their own individual functions and then talking to each other. Right. Again, in one system, you can have consumer system and then take all of these as subsystems. So if you written software programs, you would have done what's called as recursive functions. Right. Each program calling itself and going down, down level. And at the bottom level, it you kind of returns the call, right? And it keep in returning all the way up to your root program. So you can view similarly the hierarchy being broken down at multiple levels. And then let's say at this level, all of these systems are developed. And then they are integrated to give the functionality of the embodied system. Then all of these are developed. Often, right? So that's one is you have the flow down. So that's the down, down hierarchy where you say system requirement is broken down into various subsystems all the way down the hierarchy. Right? And then what flows up is the integration. Right? As you keep uh, the inter developing and integrating, it all keeps flowing up. There. So that's how you are going to have any complex system. That's how it's feasible. For someone even to envisage any system or system that spans tens of thousands of engineers, and maybe there are like especially these kind of large systems, the engineering development things may be spread across multiple geographic regions, tens of thousands of engineers. Right? And how that entire thing is being designed, developed, integrated all the way up to let's say a large aircraft or spacecraft, it is by applying some of these basic concepts of system hierarchy complex things. The other challenge that we see is also the domains. Right? All of these complex systems, they span multiple engineering domains. Right? Mechanical, electronic, software, electrical, structural, human factors, and so on. Through, right? The system spans all of them. 
So if you want to engineer such a complex systems, we can't say that hey, you need to study four years mechanical, four years electrical, four years software. Mm -hmm. No, that's not going to happen. Right. So as a system engineer, one key thing that you want to talk about here is looking at the interdisciplinary aspects. So they call of what is called as a T-shaped engineer. This T-shaped is much better. Where you might have your discipline expertise in one of these, but then from a systems perspective, you need to have your broad, your depth, your uh, breadth. Through. So like an alphabet T, you have to have the interdisciplinary appreciation and the depth of one or more disciplines. So here we're going to start looking at, for example, what should a person look designing a system be worried about? We should be worried about the interactions between them, what are the trade offs between them? For example, you're going to say that, hey, the software do this within, say, so many milliseconds. Right? Then the software team may come back and say, no, I can't do that. Right? You know, I want to do that in an SPG. Then not the processor or the hardware has to do it. I'll try to do it. Then, okay, we need a far faster processor and all of that. Now, trying to run that faster, you're going to generate more heat. Then that will have an impact for the mechanical engineers right? who's going to start looking at okay, how do we dissipate this optional heat and making the system cool? Right? So all of these decisions you take in one discipline would have implications across other disciplines. So that is those are areas that they start looking at when you look at cross discipline, uh, cross disciplinary aspects for building some of these complex systems. Through. So when you start designing these complex systems, you're going to have a lot of these say multiple. Um, Safety nets, what is called it, right? Reviews, coverage, verification, all of these happening at the system level. Right? So, for instance, I may have a system requirement that is allocated across multiple disciplines. Some may be worked on by hardware team, some may be worked on by software team, mechanical team, and so on, right? Then they all have to come together and still meet the system requirement. So, system level, you still need to do your verification, tests, and all of that, right? Integration. So, we see some cases, for example, uh, uh, you know, what are the failure areas that we see, right? So when you're trying to deal with some of these complex systems, um, you know, the interest simply cross-disciplinary interactions that happen. Yeah, the, that is one top area where, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty failure prone. Other areas is all of those interactions that happen, right? When we solve for complex systems, the interactions would kind of result in new emergent behavior. Again, trying to predict what those emergent behavior is and trying to look at, you know, how to handle that is again, a, Challenge. We'll see some examples. So, uh, this was the case of uh, uh, that has to have a very precise location. Right? Uh, so, obviously, you know, a lot of software gets reused. Uh, uh, so, in this case, uh, uh, they were storing the uh, in the earlier software that was being reused. They stored time at the granularity of about one tenth of a second in integer format. Right, and uh, so obviously, this will cause the drift. Right? And they handled the drift by rebooting the software once a while. Right? But then when you started reusing that in a different context, in this case, it was a system that has to shoot down an incoming uh, flying object. Uh, the system was off for about 100 hours, and this cost uh, you know, about one third of a second, uh, the system being uh, really off through. And uh, that caused it to miss the target with 500 meters. So that is the kind of thing where you're trying to say, uh, hey, there is this software that had uh, that was designed right for use there, but then system level it caused a miss of the target by about 500 meters. Uh, uh, we'll take a more recent case. This was a case of an auto autonomous vehicle, uh, vehicle drive driving system. Um, so in this case, uh, you know there was a debate on whether the driver was actually uh, alert when this incident happened. Uh, basically, the Driving autonomous system detected an object uh, six seconds before impact, but then it couldn't classify whether that was a what kind of object that was, to, right? And then uh, 1.2 seconds before the impact, it selected the brakes. But then uh, new action, any new actions, there was this uh, interlock that was there to prevent any kind of sudden action. So that interlock was there for one second. Essentially, this interaction between the interlock kind of so somewhere. Someone put a, a system function that interlock is needed to you know, protect against some kind of certain actions. But then uh, that interaction started um, you know, having a bearing on this kind of uh, uh, object detection. The object detection got delayed, 
and then when the action was done uh, it was interlocked or done through and so this couldn't uh, prevent uh, you know the vehicle from hitting the object so this is another case where uh, you have you see some of these complex interactions right and what essentially is the outcome of complex interactions very difficult to envisage up front but then ultimately you had uh, the vehicle hitting the object right? so there's two, two, two cases where uh, they want to highlight about uh, what these complex systems are. Uh, interactions. So I think this was just an uh, introduction on machine learning. I think most of you are familiar with. Uh, but then, uh, I mean, just to give the analogy, um, in the conventional program, um, I mean, you have data that is fed into a program, and then uh, the program produces the output. Whereas in ML, you all you're talking about, you're having the data and you're having the output. So trying to figure out what the program is. That's what machine learning is all about. Okay? So that's a very simple analogy through um, where you have machine algorithms trying to correlate what is happening uh, between the data and the outputs and try to come up with the relationships. So, okay? so these are more of the data driven models. Again, you have physics driven models. You see how both can be used to augment each other. Okay? How you have physics driven models augment some of these data driven models for you to get the better matter. Again, here we are talking about. Um, Using machine learning for engineer systems, as opposed to you know, let's say creating the, the price of uh, real estate or things like that. So, you know, we're talking about engineer systems that are governed by physical laws, right? So they are using machine learning models. Uh, you know, you need to be aware of the nuances of the uh, engineer systems. Present. Again, machine learning you are having um, supervised learning, which is basically label data and supervised learning, which is trying to form clusters around um, and label data. And then reinforcement learning. We see examples of probably supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Stop. I think uh, we start looking at the generic workflow for any uh, building any machine model. Right? Uh, we start first looking at what is the data that we have. The data will be in different formats like uh, numerical, categorical, batch series, text images. And then you decide on what those features are. And then we start looking at uh, developing those uh, machine learning models and algorithms too, uh, which essentially try to uh, correlate those features to what those. Right? So, for example, um, uh, you know, let's take the example of uh, you know, heard of machine learning models trying to predict that hey, this is the image of a cat or a dog or something. So, what do we need to do here? We need to uh, take a lot of images of cats, a lot of images of dogs. Label that these are all cat images and dog images, and then feed it to our neural network, uh, and then that learns on this classification. Right? And then you get the intelligence, which means now, given that uh, you feed in a new image of a cat or a dog, the system will be able to predict that hey, this is a cat or this is a dog. Again, now you can see a lot of talk about you know AI surpassing humanity and all of that, right? But then, even if you take a simple Scenario of trying to replace cat or dog, you need probably a hundred thousand images of cats or dogs. Uh, different images of cats looking top, down, left, right, different colors, all of that. Right? But then just reflect, right? Uh, so, your child doesn't need to see a cat a hundred thousand times before trying to say that, hey, that's a cat. That's still how far we are. So, but, uh, so that's a restriction in terms of what these are. Right? Uh, uh, but then we start looking at applying some of these to. Uh, engineer systems. Okay. A lot more comes into play, uh, which because what are the implications of those if, when, when something goes wrong, right? That matters more for engineer systems, right? So we start looking at from a system perspective, we start first, we start, I mean, we first start looking at uh, what is the intelligence that is required, what is the data that we have, um, are there any, um, you know, data uh, tolerances that are, I mean, sorry, tolerances for false things, right? So what will happen if, uh, so let's say you're having ML models predictive for uh, X-ray, you know, has some uh, manage, uh, some kind of disease conditions. What are the implications of someone with a disease is red, like he's not having a disease. For someone who does not have a disease is then classified as the case. Is having a disease, right? The implications of such false classifications are pretty significant, right? So that's where we we'll now start looking at, uh, you know, uh, what are the tolerances? What are the data sets that we have? Are there any inherent biases in the data and things like that? Right. Um, uh, so, all of these you need to keep in mind when we start looking at, you know, there is always an urge to say, hey, let's start using it, let's start using and so this model. So start looking at some of these aspects in terms of what are the implications of things go wrong? Uh, what are the implications uh, if uh, uh, 
there are biases in the data that are reflectable into the predictions and so on, right? And uh, I mean, there are a lot of these uh, implications because the intelligence and algorithm the data we used to build. You'll, you'll see a lot of um, articles on the web. Uh, for example, the AI camera that is trying to monitor the ball in the football field, mistaking the head of the referee as a ball and tracking the head referee instead of the ball. Then also you're having cases where the autonomous driving system, uh, the moon is, um, the moonlight is uh, misinterpreted as a yellow light. So now a lot of these adversarial scenarios are there, which may not come. So in fact, the, how do I say that my machine learning model is fully tested? Uh, it requires a lot of monitoring of, for the behavior of the system. Are there any adversarial scenarios that are there when you deploy it? Uh, so I suppose the conventional systems and algorithms. For example, in a conventional program, you say if A says 10, 10, do this, else do that. You can test it easily. There is no kind of uh, testing because when you start going inside a, say, a neural network and trying to see what it is, is there going to be some kind of magic numbers and some multiplications, divisions, and matrix computation that are happening? So, how do you even try to understand what the code is doing? Very difficult to uh, do that. So, that's why, uh, you know, from systems perspective, a lot of thought process now is getting in uh, both medicine academy in terms of. What are the restrictions or what are the cases we need to be aware of cognizant of when you start looking at some of these measuring models and applying it to engineer systems that are governed by physics where failure implications are pretty high. Like the only safety implications, uh, there will be other regulatory aspects that we need to take care of. Too. So some of the actual considerations uh, the negative side effects, remote hacking, unsafe exploration, shift in the data, let's say uh, whatever data you have used will represent some operational conditions. What if the ML model is uh, experiencing a scenario outside that? But it may still go ahead and predict it. Uh, let's say you clean or uh, you train a robot to clean. Uh, but then while cleaning, it's damaging other data things. Or it's trying to um, you know, make the floor dirty and then clean it again. Some of those kind of things are uh, you can't predict what the behavior is when you start to move and So, a lot of these are considerations of um, coming to play when you start looking at um, using machine learning models for uh, some of uh, you know, these engineering systems. The complex system does not work. So, that's on the first part. Uh, any queries or any specific uh, questions? Yeah, I have one question. Like you spoke about this model, but most of the ML model are not transparent. They are like opaque kind of black box behavior. So how you like model around those looking at your failure and other analysis? Because we cannot say like an ML model or mostly neural network ready bit model whether it is telling correct. It does not work well. So how what are the risk implications in those scenarios when we are building this? Yeah, so so one is right now still the adoption of machine learning models for safety critical systems is still not that. Uh, because the explainability of that, especially when you start looking at uh, if that's a failure, uh, it's going to cause loss in life. Right? Or uh, look at an initial plant, it was going to cause initial. So those areas, um, ML models are still not being used. Right? Uh, whereas, let's say, mobile phone wants to predict the next text in a plant, right? they are used. Now, uh, in these kind of regulatory industries, we have what is called different safety levels. Let's say for a new aircraft, you have something like level A, B, C, D, E. Level A means if that fails, uh, it's going to cause a loss of life. Which means conventionally those systems have to be certified to a level of uh, 10 power minus 9 probability of failure. Or machine information, right? So maybe 11 B is 10 power minus 7, like that. So now machine models is talked about, uh, you know, not in those safety critical scenarios, but like in can it be used in any offboard applications, for example, on an iPad or a pilot? Or we are trying to reduce the workload of a pilot, as opposed to taking the critical decisions that will have impact, right? So that's why it is. Now, on the research side, there is a lot of research going on explainability of those models. Like, how do you guarantee the output? Then, how do you do failure mode analysis saying that if that output is goes wrong, right? Do you have additional safety nets? One of slides I talked about safety nets, right? Can you take those additional safety nets to bound the outputs or to say that if these outputs are there, there are these additional conventional systems that are driven systems that will take over if the uh, data driven system fails? 
it not produces some misleading information. So integrity matters also not for the things. But it says that it is okay for a system to fail than to mislead the pilot. So don't give a wrong information. It's okay to give a not to give any information. It should not say, for example, give out a wrong information that altitude aircraft is something whereas actually it is something else, because then that may take the make the pilot to take a different action. It is okay to not even display that. Thing. That's why mission information uh, matters a lot. So there are specific probability levels associated with each of those functions, which are strictly bounded. So those scenarios, ML is not still not the things. And like one more thing like regarding this only, you talked about like Google that adversarial fooling and this kind of things are taken into consideration like while designing this. Yeah, so typically there are additional test scenarios in terms of. Uh, when you're trying to test those uh, these kind of ML models, right? but then you can never be sure that you are done. It's the definition of done is not that, as opposed to conventional software or conventional algorithms. So that still remains a challenge. Typically, what happens is they train the model based on the data that we have, knowledge we have, deploy it, monitor it. Something is wrong. Get those additional data, retrain it, again deploy it. So the iteration keeps happening. We can't afford those iterations in safe critical systems. So, any more questions from the person here? Uh, we can move ahead to the online questions. Uh, if anyone uh, attending online has any question, then we encourage them to uh, put them up in the chat and we can take them now before we break for the uh, IT, or then we can even take it at, towards the end. We'll be having a dedicated question and answer session. So, you can put it up then as well. So yeah, we would. Yeah, so we can see someone has a hand raised. So if you could please type your question in the chat. Uh, on the chat. Ulhas Patil. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Hello. Due to technical constraints, we won't be able to unmute you. So yeah, you are requested to please, if possible, put your chat, put your question in the chat box. You can take your time to type. No problem on that. We'll join you soon afterwards. So anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Sure. Told we cannot deploy ML for the level A, level B system. We so deploy for level C and level D kind of system. So this kind of extra testing is required for the whole system. So, so especially if say they think there are these levels and associated cost as well and regulatory standards. So right now standards and they're not talking about level D and E, not even B and C. So I think uh, the related agencies like FAA are like they're coming up with kind of guidelines for all of them. But still it is uh, in work, it is not a uh, so I said this thing. They talk about like in conventional uh, systems, we have this V model, but they talk about the W model where they talk about the learning assurance, right? So we assure that the learning of that ML model is complete, right? Uh, what, what is the data that you have? How are you ensuring that the data spans the operation scenarios of your system? So there are those additional constraints on which we'll have to do these additional testing of that learning data too. The learning assurance of its part of But they are all in work to make to do that for the civil innovation. Similar kind of standards are being developed uh, for uh, you know, other sector critical systems too. Is there any additional guidelines on the one like the human seven eight bills that for yeah other preservation support if we use ML? Yeah, that's where you can look at like for example, ESI has come out. I think it's a second revision is there. You can Google and uh, check that for the guidelines for uh, bad bills for. Uh, if you're trying to plan to use ML, it talks about all these learning machines now. They have released a second draft. Okay. Yeah. But from first day, these ML models will save a lot of cost. Uh, it does not have cost. Uh, advantage of using ML instead of conventional methods for whatever we are using. Hmm. So these are primarily data data driven model, right? Especially looking at physics of engineering systems when the physics becomes really complex. 
So some challenges, for example, basic physics equation will assume a lot of ideal conditions. Like for example, this is the condition of the atmosphere, and this is the condition of the pressure and all of that. Right? So when you do the actual thing where decimals matter, you will see they take actual measurements, they will vary a bit from the physics. That's where the data-driven models come in. And we are trying to deal with the complex state space. We we'll see both examples in the case studies uh, when you look at population variation. Where let's say I'm having a 45 or 50 variables to determine the state. Trying to do a physics equation correlating all of that, it will become a real challenge. So that we try to learn from data. So that um, I mean, you can start off if you went from ML model for taking the mass acceleration and taking the force, but then you know that force is mass acceleration. So where it is conventional algorithm is that you would still go and use that. But where you're going to have some of these complex states, complex spaces, complex systems of talking about. But physics also becomes really complex. You might have physics based equations to do the basic part and then add on data driven models, or you might go in fully for data driven models because the physics is too complex to model and understand in terms of those physics. So yeah, any more yeah. questions? Any more chat? Mike, I think chat has some issues. Guest, guest, I think chat has some issues. Mike, ask them to use Mike. Yeah. Unmute them. You are like organizing here. Sir, so basically uh -huh. there are the two uh, machine learning models used. One for the prediction and another for the behavior estimation uh, evolution. In this graph. Yes. Okay, the so same machine learning? Yeah, two, two examples. Okay. And sir, uh, another question is, what is, uh, you intend that SVM, the neural networks, the SVM, what is basically the SVM? Can you, sir, please explain? Uh, so we will see two examples of uh, uh, oh. using machine learning models. I'll go to the example okay. subsequently. Uh, one is for printing okay. the fuel flow of an aircraft, and one more for uh, uh, looking at um, you know a swarm of UAB, so we will look at both these examples. Maybe when I cover that, it will be clear on how the models were being used in those two okay. scenarios. Too. Okay. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah, if there is anyone else uh, having another question, then you can uh, unmute yourself and proceed. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir. Uh usually when you uh, want to use a physics based model to design any system you also get uh, the dependence on whatever variables uh, or whatever parameters you have to optimize for so but in uh, machine learning models it's i mean uh, difficult to uh, sometimes trace uh, how the particular parameter is affecting the final output uh, beyond its very local range so how is how do you make sure uh, that the parameter, uh, I mean, final tuning of the parameters is done to get the optimal result? Yeah, so there are two parts here. So when we are trying to predict something, um, when we go, say, strictly by the physics, there may be a delta error. Uh, that is that uh, uh, when you do the actual measurements as compared to what the physics says through, right? Now you can also have a machine learning model that learns what is a delta error based on different scenarios through, right? And use that delta error corrections to augment the physics model uh, with the delta for the realistic scenarios, right? Uh, which may not, uh, you know, adhere to the ideal scenarios or specific conditions the physics models, uh, uh, you know, use through, right? So that is one scenario. The second scenario is where you can also look at the trend of the uh, behavior that's happening. And then predict if something is going to go wrong or uh, uh, some behavior is going to happen based on which you can take a uh, appropriate action. So both these scenarios will see an example. So probably when I go through those two examples, uh, you know, uh, uh, in subsequently we'll, uh, uh, you know, it may give a better picture of how uh, some of these models can be leveraged. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Could you show some light on the validation and verification of ML models? Like, are there any standards being evolved or? How are people usually doing it? Yeah, Validation they are being it. evolved. Yeah, they are being evolved right now. You can have a look at, uh, you know, you can search for uh, uh, 
uh, say there is one that is being released by EASA, the European uh, agency. Uh, you can look at, they talk about this learning assurance, W model and all of that. Uh, I think the second revision of that has been uh, released. Uh, so you can look at some of those. Uh, uh, they all talk about what are the additional considerations you need to have to, um, you know, verify and validate these models through. Right? Most of them are all in work uh, uh, or maybe first version or second version and so on. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, the chat has disabled due to some difficulties, technical difficulties, so yes, sorry for that. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I see another hand. Sorry. Please go ahead with your question. Unmute yourself and we can take it on the Q&A now. Okay, then uh, we'll take the break now and uh, we'll take the rest of the questions towards the end in the Q&A sessions. So now we'll be uh, resuming our session. Thank you for staying tuned and waiting for the uh, event to continue. So now I'll request uh, Dr. Rao to continue. Sure, thank you. All right. So welcome back. So we will look at uh, you know a few case studies, uh, you know, just to illustrate the scenario of how we do it. Um, the first one is on the machine learning models for performance predictions. So here, uh, this is based on uh, two of the work that you can see here. Um, one was on IEEE conference and another was uh, uh, Springer uh, event too. So here, what we are talking about is, um, you know, how we can use machine models to predict the fuel that is consumed. Uh, in aircraft, right? uh, you know, so typically in aircraft, we have a lot of physics uh, that comes into play in, uh, in terms of the fuel. That is consumed. So we look at say, can we look at the data and then see correlate that to the fuel that is consumed. So so here uh, this talks about why these models are of interest here. Right? So when you start looking at uh, the fuel, uh, a lot of you know factors impact of what the uh, what is the amount of fuel that is consumed, right? So what is the altitude in which the aircraft is flying? What is the rate that is being carried? Uh, what is the uh, temperature uh, that's outside, atmospheric conditions, what is the speed in which it's traveling and so on, right? and what is the wind experience. So, so I'm trying to start looking at uh, you know, first, what is the data that's applicable. I need to first gather data across all of the scenarios. Right? That matters most. Let's say I get data only when the aircraft is flying at, say, 30,000 feet. And I build my measuring model. And then I use that to predict what is the fuel uh, when the aircraft is flying at 45 feet, it's going to be off. Okay. So first the key step for you is to start looking at what are all the operational scenarios, conditions in which the system is being subjected to. Do you have data that covers that? Right. So in this case, for example, uh, we have over 170 plus scenarios of uh, various altitudes, various gross rates, various speed, various acceleration, deceleration, all of those. We have to get data Spanning all those conditions, right? only then our model would be robust. Enough. Otherwise, it's going to give very erroneous predictions. Too, right? uh, so the first part is looking at, you know, for example, the graph that you see here uh, looks at um, uh, at various combinations of uh, speed, um, the back, uh, the fuel flow that is happening, the tailwind conditions, uh, acceleration, decelerations, all of that. Right? What is the kind of uh, uh, fuel flow that is happening? Right? And then. You have to start visualizing this data to see if the data that you have matches your physics based understanding. Right? For example, flying at lower altitudes uh, with higher weight is going to consume uh, more fuel than flying at higher altitudes with at a faster speed. So, so you have to first see if the data that you have matches the physics. Because ML model is not going to understand any of those, right? It's going to just be more data points, right? right? So that's where data visualization comes in. And then, uh, especially in this case where you have uh, six or seven data elements, right? Uh, different data elements. Very difficult to visualize six dimensional, seven dimensional data. At most, we can visualize only a three dimension. So that's where you know takes techniques such as principal component analysis, which can be used to reduce uh, you know high dimensional data to lower dimensional. Uh, you know, projection. Right? So, such kind of PGA kind of techniques you can start using it through. So, for example, here uh, in this figure, you can see uh, representing the altitude, speed, gross air temperature, all of these four dimensions onto a single dimension, and then plotting that against a fuel flow. Right? Helps you to give a lower, I mean, more a better visualization 
and try to see how some of these uh, makes you know that makes physics sense or not, right? Okay. Then you can start feeding. So in this case, you had like uh, nine parameters that you had to feed into a neural network um, and let it learn the correlation between these nine parameters and the fuel flow. Uh, so in this specific study, I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, again uh, decisions you'll have to take for your neural network in terms of how many layers are there. How many nodes per uh, layer? Then what are the activation functions you want to use? So in this study, actually, we did um, the performance comparisons of prediction comparison between uh, three kind of activation functions. So one was a scaled um, uh, exponential linear unit, silo, and there was a relu uh, leaky ref, uh, unit, and one was hyperloop tangent. Right? So there's a trade-off involved in terms of uh, which kind of uh, what is your neural network architecture. Uh, how many hidden layers, how many uh, nodes per layer, and modern activation functions. So in this case, the study focused on trying to characterize the performance of the prediction. Uh, so this on the y-axis is your uh, mean, mean percentage error. So you can see it hovers between uh, 2 to 3 or 4 percent. Right? And then error is Again, um, so this was another study where we looked at uh, looking at the uh, tail specific, which means like uh, and aircraft, um, as it keeps flying in different regions, may be subjected to different variant, uh, uh, different uh, uh, deterioration of the aerodynamic surfaces and all of that. Thing, right? So the generic model, there will be deviations from them. Right? So then can you get the data pertaining to each specific tail? So this is as good as separating, say, for your own car or for, for your own two-wheeler, what is the fuel? You will see that uh, the manufacturer per se will uh, say this is the fuel consumption. Right, or the fuel uh, efficiency, but then that will vary based on how you use. Right? And you can come up with your own data for your vehicle and then right? So that is uh, similar to what we have done here. Can you do a uh, tail specific or route specific models? Right. So this was again um, uh, published in IEEE like, paper uh, uh, where we looked at um, uh, tail specific or route specific models, get data for those specific tails and routes, and then predict based on that. Uh, so that is uh, an example of uh, machine learning models for performance predictions where we are trying to predict. Uh, we look at models for uh, predicting uh, the behavior. Right? So here uh, we will take two cases. This is again uh, was uh, published uh, uh, in the Infosys Symposium as well as in the IEEE uh, Systems Conference through, where we are trying to look at uh, leveraging some of these models to understand and predict what the behavior of the system is. Right? And then we also talked about uh, uh, a system trying to adjust its behavior. That's where we did uh, reinforcement learning. We try to use reinforcement learning for the system to adjust or adapt its behavior in tandem with what is happening at the overall um, system level. Now we see, see some examples. So here, uh, this is the case of a swarm of UAVs. So here is a case where you're looking at a swarm of UAVs. Uh, they are trying to fly together. And uh, probably they need to fly in a pattern, right? And they need to do their mission, whatever the mission is. Doing. Yeah. So here we talked about a uh, system having uh, uh, multiple uh, a system or system having multiple uh, systems, and uh, each of them having their uh, mission and effectiveness. So we talked about MOEs in the first uh, uh, section, right? And then they have start looking at. Uh, um, what are the MOEs at a system or system level? Right? So, for example, for a swarm, the MOEs will pertain to overall mission of the swarm. Um, you know, they're not colliding with each other and all of uh, those together. Right? The time duration for transition uh, from one formation to other safety separation constraints. At each system level, again, you will have MOEs that talked about uh, meeting its individual system right? and ensuring that it doesn't. Uh, um, collide with other uh, adjacent uh, UAVs. So now here we're talking about, can we have a machine learning model that observes what is going on at system level across these UAVs by trying to predict if some things can go wrong. So now what will be uh, uh, the state of this system? Right? We want to characterize the state of the system. It will relate to, uh, for example, what are the what are the pairwise distances between each of those UAVs? So you're going to have something like, um, I think, probably six pairwise distance for each UAV, right? With you know, adjacent UAVs through. Have the slopes, right, on, say, the X, Y, and Y, Z planes. So all of these variables form together the state of a system. 
Um, so how we how we can model that? Right? So, uh, so actually, in this case, we built a lot of um, symbolic models. Uh, you can see here. Um, So in this case, you're going to have. Uh, so you can see here some simulation of various scenarios of uh, the UAVs changing shape, right, or, or across those different planes, rolling pitch and rolling plane, um, changing the shape of the formation and so on through, right. So. Remember the previous case we talked about those 170 plus scenarios, right? So here uh, again we had whether various other scenarios that could happen, and that's where we used this orthogonal arrays. That is again a good thing for you to you know come up with a reduced subset of things that you want to simulate, right? You can Google for design of experiments or orthogonal arrays. Um, so here you had like these multiple scenarios conditions. What is the initial final shape? Uh, what are the angles? What are the wind gusts that is that is being experienced through? Uh, so here we're going to again have complete permutation combinations. We can use an orthogonal array to come up with a reduced set of uh, uh, you know combinations that you want to build your uh, simulation uh, and get the data on. Right. So in this case, you can see there are about 27 different combinations uh, that kind of exercises all those. Uh, various uh, levels, what they call, what they call as factors and levels. Right? It's called a fractional factorial, and then you can get data for these, right? Uh, and then we talked about PCA, the right? crystal complex analysis. Uh, so I think you had like uh, uh, fifteen pairwise distances and thirty slopes, right? So you had forty-five variables. Very difficult to visualize those 45 variables. Right? So here on the x-axis, you did a PCA of distance, which combines all those 15 variables into a one variable. Right? Similarly, on the y-axis, you had like 35, sorry, 30 slopes. Again, you combine all of those into a, uh, a single projection. Now you have you can visualize easily on those two dimensions. Right? So this PCA is a good technique, a mathematical technique for you to visualize higher dimensional uh, behavior or to lower dimensional. Uh, you know projections, and then here you can see that uh, now we are able to say label these uh, specific data as good or bad data. You can actually see some pattern here. Right? So all this beyond on the right of this zone was where the you know the UAVs are flying in a bad behavior, and all those uh, things on the left side of this zone were where they were exhibiting good behavior. Right? So now we are able to visualize. Right? I suppose the earlier scenario where you have three variables. Very difficult to visualize what is happening, right? Where there is good and bad behavior. Right? <clears throat> so this behavior analysis through PCA is uh, you know, a very good technique. Um, so again, here you can see here, um, looking at the MOEs. Uh, um, so here the red zones are where, at the overall system level, at the system system level, both um, the system is uh, SOS is not behaving good as well as the individual one constant system which is like uav3 is not good uh, this scenario of green is where the uav is uh, uh, and the sos is good through and the yellow is where uav is good uh, whereas the sos is not good what it means that <coughs> individually at a component level things are okay but at a system level it is not happening good right so that is at these two level this is at swarm level and this is at the uav level too. So you, you can have a, one UAV behaving good, but then overall swarm behaving badly. Uh, so those are those regions that are there. You have the green, yellow, and red regions. Now you can do what is called um, you know, the unsupervised learning the machine learning model, where uh, um, you can use this nearest neighbor classification tree. You can see the predictions that are coming. It kind of uh, matches with this physics-based one, what you have. Uh, the right here, the yellow here, or the green here. You can see, see similarly the red, yellow, and the green zones, right? Kind of matching. So this was using the KNN and the fitted pattern classification based trees. Um, this is comes under unsupervised learning. The earlier case of for prediction was supervised learning, where you had labeled data. Right? Here in machine model, here are using unsupervised learning algorithm to try to predict the behavior of the swarm as a whole. Okay, not spending much time here. So here it goes into. Uh, uh, so here you can actually see here uh, the x x y y z slope. So one UAV 
the time wise distance set slopes with the other other you went through so totally you had something like 45 variables here um and then they are then fed into a machine based classifier uh where it learns uh, positive emergent behavior which is one or uh, zero is negative emergent um and then the overall um you can see the neural network um, understanding of being fed the trend of the information right either you can use like a network or like an mstm that learns right or in this case we passed in uh, data for the last four to five times right? So then you you, would, uh, you are having a network even learning, predicting ahead in time whether something is going to go wrong. So the trend was also the network was going to pick up. So you can see here, uh, this is the labeled data. And here you can see the machine classifier uh, creating zero means bad behavior and going close to one is good behavior. So you can see uh, the machine learning classifier predicting uh, in tandem with what the actual truth data is. So this means the classifier is able to predict uh, ahead in time. Uh, you can see here, right? Predict, predict that things are going to go bad a little bit ahead in time. Um, because it is based on the trend of you know, the data. That is there, right? In this case, we just fed in the last five timestamps. You can feed in the additional uh, timestamps also to get the additional trend information. Um, second case um, within the swarm was uh, I look at it. So typically in a swarm, in a homogeneous swarm, you are going to have identical UAVs which are trained uh, with the same machine learning model or whatever it is, same algorithms. They are all trained to uh, collaborate in a swarm. Right? So that's a typical uh, homogeneous or other standard swarm. In the case of swarm, you are going to have a case where uh, basically those algorithms may be different. They are, uh, say, like UAB is designed by different companies, different uh, developers. They're all, now you want to have them collaborate with each other. Right? That is the case of a heterogeneous swarm. Um, so in this case, um, uh, again, the figure on the top right talks about a swarm of uh, uh, UABs. Now you're going to have a MOIS at the swarm level, as well as um, uh, you know, individual, each of those UAVs again have their MOV, MOVs uh, uh, through, right? And at overall uh, swarm level, you are going to have uh, uh, mission objectives uh, and the behavior that are exhibited at the swarm level impacts the MOVs at the swarm. Whereas each individual UAV, whatever behavior it exhibits, um, you know, uh, impacts the MOVs of those individual UAVs through, right? Uh, so in this case, is where you're uh, having a swarm of UAVs. Um, so here, uh, there are different means in which you can analyze the relationships between what happens at a system level and uh, and, and what happens at a swarm level. Right? Uh, you can do a simple relationship matrix, uh, but then in this case, uh, since the relationship is complex, uh, you can leverage neural networks again to do the relationships between what happens as the uh, individual constituent UAV versus what happens at the overall swarm. Um, so the approach here. Uh, it talks about having one intelligent agent. Uh, it's called an IBEA, intelligent behavior evolution agent, that is embedded in those UAVs. So in this case, you're going to have heterogeneous uh, UAVs of uh, you know, different models makes all of that. In that, you put in a, a behavior evolution agent, right? which is essentially a reinforcement learning agent, an RL agent. So those are familiar with RL. Uh, you know, there is an environment, uh, there is an agent uh, which takes an action, and then it gets a reward back. And then based on that, it tries to come up with a policy on what are the actions it can take. A typical reinforcement learning is um, you know, on that. Uh, so here in this case, what we have is uh, uh, we're having an IDEA uh, embedded in, in those um, uh, constituent UAVs, which kind of tries to look at uh, what is the relationship, uh, what is the actions it needs to take, and what the rewards it's getting, and based on that. Uh, should it modify its behavior or not? Uh, so the overall approach, um, as we see here, is we first have a uh, MOE relationships. We have what's called the machine learning classifier, observing what is going on at the system level and uh, trying to uh, advise uh, or give rewards. Right. So RL, you have what is this called the like rewards. 
So it has to reward this agent here, uh, the learning intelligent agent here, in terms of what is good and what is not good. So once you do that, then you have this idea with the ability to learn to adapt itself. In essence here, what you have is, uh, you have the individual constituent uh, uh, UAVs. Uh, first, they are already pre-trained to behave well as an individual. So how do they learn to behave well as in a swarm? Uh, so in this case, we are having um, uh, uh, first uh, the behavior model established at the swarm level, um, and each of the constituent uh, system uh, to the uh, swarm level relationships being established and learned through, and then um, this classifier serving as the uh, environment and rewarding the ID. So that is the overall framework that is set up through. So here you can see here uh, uh, there are three scenarios here. Uh, so this is how uh, reinforcement learning training happens and RL training happens here. Um, so, so in this first case, uh, you are having um, you know, an action uh, taken. Um, the UAV learns and it's trained uh, as in an individual context. That is a non-swarm context uh, where it tries to maximize its behavior as an individual. Right? And it's able to optimize uh, its uh, relations. Then you are going to take that UAV and put it into a swamp. So when you start putting it in a swamp, so it has to now learn how to adjust its behavior to a swamp. Too, right? So you can see the dip here, uh, where it is trying to adjust itself to learn to a new set of desired actions. So uh, initially, it has learned on what are the desirable actions as an individual. The now, now when it's put into a swamp, there is a learning period where it tries to learn what are the actions. Uh, uh, that it has to readjust itself for operating together in a swarm. So the swarm is has to collaborate with other UAVs and then the mission objective is the swarm's objectives. So that learning happens here and then you can see that uh, it uh, has then converged to the new set of uh, actions it needs to take to uh, operate at a swarm level. Right? Uh, so essentially you are having uh, the RL of uh, the intelligent agent uh, readjusting its behavior, right? So a constituent EAV is readjusting its behavior to operate in a swarm. So that is what this experiment says. So this again details are there in the two published papers that uh, uh, I had indicated in that. So essentially, what are these? This can be kind of uh, taken as a plugin component uh, across all of those constituent EAVs. And uh, you could use uh, this um, intelligent agent to learn itself, to learn to adapt itself, right? So essentially having a component trying to learn and adapt, adapt itself to what matters at the overall system level. Because what is optimum at uh, the component level may not be optimum at the system level. So that that's a local optimum versus the global optimum. So here they're having the system learning to adjust its behavior to suit the global optimum. Uh, so, but obviously there are constraints. Uh, um, if there is the system level behavior uh, or the swarm level behavior is so drastically different, it's going to take more learning episodes for it to uh, learn. That, right? that adaptation is uh, still a challenge. So that's the case. So we saw essentially uh, three cases. The first case was trying to predict the performance of, uh, in this case, it was the CL flow. Uh, both uh, for individual aircraft as well as the tank based or road based uh, some model. Through. The second case is, uh, was for uh, operating the behavior. And the third one was for adapting the behavior. So those were the um, three cases that we saw. I think uh, so. You could actually look at uh, you know this is the system engineering body of knowledge, CBOC, it's called. It's a guide to systems engineering body of uh, knowledge. It's like a wiki. Um, so this is uh, actually if, if you want to pick up a lot on system thinking, system principles, you know, this is a place to go. The CBOC is a place to go to. It you, you will talk about the basic uh, system science and systems thinking and overall system. Uh, so in that, actually, we have one of the sections on AI, uh, which looks at uh, when you're looking at applying AI for complex systems, uh, what are the aspects you need to consider? Uh, additional considerations we talked about in one of the earlier, like uh, for example, additional failure modes and all of that. Through it gives pointers to all of that. 
But overall, for picking the uh, when picking up the overall systems perspective, systems thinking, uh, the C book is a very good place. The other is the Incozy handbook, the International Council of Systems Engineering, uh, which is also Western Society English. So they also have the similar handbook, uh, but that's accessible only to members of Incozy, similar to uh, Incozy also has a professional society for systems engineering person. So you could uh, actually have a look at that uh, uh, handbook too, uh, but this is open for uh, public, uh, the C book. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of the systems concept thinking, I mean, you could find a lot of uh, uh, master's degree program in universities abroad on systems engineering perception. So it's an active research area that looks at uh, applying some of the systems concepts for these complex uh, systems, right from uh, considering the requirements, uh, looking at the system architecture design, multidisciplinary trade-offs or optimization, uh, then your inter system integration problems uh, and research uh, and then verification validation, uh, and then looking at all these cross-cutting attributes of a quality attributes of a system, right? What do you look at safety, reliability, uh, security, maintainability, uh, which are more of the systems perspective. Right? So all of these uh, are um, you know addressed when you start looking at the uh, from the overall system point of view. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we'll talk about when I mean, we talked about using machine learning models for performance prediction. Aircraft fuel flow example was that. Uh, for behavior analysis, uh, which was the effect of behavior of swarm and behavior evaluation, evolution, where we talked about uh, even if we trained you, we trying to adjust its behavior and adapt to a swarm uh, condition. Right. So, uh, so all of these you will see. Uh, uh, it started off with the physics model, and then uh, we used um, uh, data-driven models to you know, augment uh, the physics, and then uh, leverage that to predict, you know, the behavior of uh, the zero system or uh, trying to adapt uh, the behavior in tune with the overall resource the Yeah. So this, I'd like to conclude and open for any queries or questions. The questions online. Unmute. Sir, uh, I have a question. Hmm. Sir, uh, so uh, basically, in the uh, for heterogeneous swarm uh, collection, the the uh, phenomenon is complex compared to the homogeneous collection. So, um, yes. Uh, so, so yes, yes, sir. Heterogeneous form case, uh, you have you are having multiple different systems that have been uh, with the different uh, models trained. Now you are trying to have an IBA that tries to learn and adapt uh, uh, an individual uh, EAB in tune with what is expected for the uh, at the swarm level, through, right? So that behavior adaptation is what the case study talks about. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. There any other questions? Uh, want to unmute and ask? Okay. Any questions from? Uh... People here, when you are speaking of the models to be trained, so it's being trained on that sensor input data from various uh, aerial vehicles. Yes, so in both cases, in this case, you can use simulations, like for example, the back lab sending models, you can use to do that. Okay. Um, uh, in this case, like for example, the aircraft fuel flow, you can use the simulated data as well as the real data. But then they are all dependent on the aircraft model type, the configuration, the shape of the aircraft. So those also will have to factor in. So uh, this learning, typically, it is better to do it in a simulated environment because learning in a real environment is very fast. You don't want to learn that all of things. And so, how much of fidelity can we expect uh, from the simulation when it is migrated to the real environment? Uh, so that depends on the strength of your uh, simulation model, right? How well, how well you're modeling it. So, uh, in case of in Aero, Aero, we do really very good simulation models. So that is. Uh, really good. 
these kind of simulations are generally available in uh, open domain or uh, you need to design it for your requirement uh both uh, some are available but then they may not have good fit data you may have to build on that plus you may also have to collect real data and see how good the fit is and see what your missing score is so those models that we have are again different on the flight type and the they are good for the models, custom, custom models. Typically, they are custom models for it. Open source, don't give you. Already, there must be so many vehicles of various manufacturers. It's very difficult to consider all of them together. Yeah, okay. it's, it's specific to the type of the vehicle. Any more questions from the people here? Or from the online, you can just uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your questions. Practice is it? So uh, I personally had a question. So in general, we see that when we come to airborne systems, uh, physically we do a winter testing or something in a closed big chamber before we go to the outside world. So like you mentioned over here that we'll be having a software based uh, um, evaluation first based on some model. So do we have some such kind of like in a room inside a closed chamber, such kind of evaluations as well or? After doing the software part, we directly go to the on field part. No, that will all be interesting. But in internal, this is a very crucial part. And even in internal, there will be a lot of data that is collected, which tries to map with the physics that you have done, as well as what is actually coming in the process. Yeah. Plus, even after uh, the new plane is designed, there are a lot of flight tests that are yeah, subject to mm -hmm. Where a lot of data again is collected yeah. to fine tune again all the physics based situations, the coefficients. Corrections and all of that. And the controller curves and the vehicle curves. So, a lot of those flight tests happen, and all of those again are put back in the software. Anymore. But iteration, much more iteration is happening. So, sir, uh, when we talk about this uh, drones nowadays, we do automate, uh, like, uh, uh, and totally autonomous landing and takeoffs. So, when we are talking about like multiple of things, uh, them functioning together, like you mentioned, these so, form of drones. So, how are they modeled? Like, uh, like in the software, do we have separate systems based on them, or do we just have like, like, uh, we just? So, in this case, what we say, we had the. Um, you can see the model here. We actually simulated. This was like in uh, MATLAB. So you can actually see a model here. Uh, six years. Yeah. Right? So the controls are. You had a very control. You had a control system model here for each of these, and then you also had a. Uh, Another command that comes in saying this is the shape, then each of them, what force they hit, apply, in which directions, so all of those are modeled. So they, they are the physics based models, I don't details. So this paper has the details of uh, this first paper, it has the details of uh, the physics models, which is again something like uh, what it says, which, which had that. And uh, then based on that, uh, we then did the machine learning model on top of that. So that Data collection was this one. Sir, I have a, uh, one question. Yes. Sir, uh, you have uh, talk, so you have talked about uh, variables that uh, you have used in for uh, machine learning. So, I mean, how many, how, which type of variables you have used? I mean, dependent, independent, uh, extravenous, or intravenous? I mean. The white which spectra um, spectra of uh, variables you have used. So, I mean, if you look at the specific case uh, from a system perspective, you need to first look at uh, what are the what is what is representing the state of your system through, right? So, uh, in in um, I think the sorry, I'll just go back. I think it takes some time to refresh. Yeah. 
So in this case, what you can see on the top right corner, this is the model of uh, six UAVs, right? Now, what is the state of the system is what you need to first look at, right? So here, if you are seeing here, um, in this case, since we are modeling the uh, analyzing the behavior of formation shape changing, uh, the state pertains to uh, the shape of the formation, right? How is that defined? It is defined by the distances, pairwise distances between each of the UAVs. So, for example, uh, UAV from UAV one to UAV two, UAV one to UAV three, UAV to UAV four, like that, right? So you have the pairwise distances. Then, since it's a three-dimensional uh, uh, scenario, you also have the pairwise slopes, through, right, on X, Y, Y, Z plane, right? So, so these are real numbers that whatever you are uh, seeing here. Uh, Slide yeah, yeah. So you can see here you have the pairwise distance and pairwise slopes, right? So all of these are real numbers, um, or you call it in software float or whatever it is, doubles, um, which are essentially the uh, sensor readings of those pairwise distances and the uh, uh, slopes, that, right? And uh, uh, based on that, you can kind of model uh, the state of the system. So in this case, there were 45 variables uh, together that were defining the state of the swamp. Right? Uh, 15 pairwise distances and 30 pairwise slopes. So your input here um, had those uh, 45 variables uh, along the last four samples right? for the trend. Uh, so it is like 45 into four were the inputs and the output here was a classification, the classification network, which had a zero or one for a positive or negative emotion behavior. Hope that answers the question. Sir, so uh, you have included only dependent and independent variables. All of these, the state variables are all independent, right? Okay, so I mean, there are variables uh, which affect the relationship between dependent and independent variables. So, have yeah, you included? Yeah, so all of these uh, variables together determine whether uh, they are going uh, zero or one, positive or emergent. So, now we are trying to understand, uh, so we are trying to understand the correlation between uh, the trend of those variables, what the variables, into this, into the behavior of the overall swamp. Okay, sir. Thank you. So we are running out of time. So uh, one last question, maybe from the online or offline attendance, and then we will wrap up the session. So basically, we are we are trying to predict uh, some kind of you know unrequired uh, behavior. That is what we are trying to predict. The classifier case, yes. Second case, we are trying to predict the performance for the first case. I'm going to predict the actual number saying so much kilogram per second is so fuel that is consumed. So that's the first case. So second case, I'm trying to predict if things are going good or going bad. Okay. So that's a behavior class. Third case is a behavior adaptation. Trying to modify the behavior. Uh, so, so that they remain in the formation. Which whatever that was. What is the uh, objective of the overall swap? Okay, so with this, we come to the end of this uh, wonderful session. So, thank you, Dr. Raman. And now I would request our uh, chapter advisor to uh, come and give a token of appreciation. Small moment for Pamar and Thank you very much.